The European Central Bank's Governing Council decided at its most recent monetary policy meeting to lower interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point. It was the first time we cut rates in five years, but more importantly, it came after a series of 10 rate hikes in a row that ran from July 2022 to September 2023. Those rate hikes were needed to fight rising inflation, which peaked at 10.6% in late 2022, driven by a series of shocks such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine that disrupted supply chains and sent energy prices soaring. Now, inflation is much, much closer to our 2% goal, and the rate cut marks a new phase of our monetary policy. But what exactly that phase will entail is not yet clear, because there is still a lot of uncertainty. It's against this backdrop that central bankers, academics and analysts will be in Sintra, Portugal, from the 1st to the 3rd of July for the annual ECB Forum on Central Banking. This year's topic is monetary policy in an era of transformation. And one of those attending is our executive board member and chief economist, Philip R. Lane, who I'm delighted to welcome in the studio today to discuss those latest decisions. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here, Paul. Now, uh, you're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Paul Gordon. This is uh, the first time I've done this podcast, but Philip is an old hand. So welcome back. Great to have you here. Let's start with the main news. Uh, Philip, as we noted, you and your colleagues in the Governing Council lowered our three key interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point. Before that, you'd raise rates by four and a half percentage points at an unprecedented speed in the history of the euro area. Since September, rates have been on hold, and now rates have been cut. So tell us how you came to this decision to act. So uh, as you said in the introduction, uh, there's a very good reason that we did have the hiking cycle, which went, as as you say, from from July 22 to September 23. And uh, we we had inflation at the extraordinary level of 10.6% in October 2022. And... uh, Last September, uh, when we did go to a key policy rate of 4%, essentially the narrative at the time was, even if inflation was falling, because it was falling by then, uh, we had a concern that inflation would remain too high for too long. So in other words, that inflation always has a kind of a dynamic element. And having been at double digits in late 22. Uh, more or less by September last year, uh, inflation was around five. So it come down, but five is very far away from 2%. Uh, and what we basically decided that we can see uh, progress. We don't necessarily need to keep on hiking, but we need essentially to enter into a holding phase. Uh, and we would be watching. We'd be watching... Um, essentially to see is inflation continuing to improve? Are we increasingly confident that inflation will come back to our, towards our target within a reasonable time period, which you know, for, for the discussions these days is, is the second half of 2025, which is about a year, year and a half from now. And essentially what happened is last autumn, uh, inflation continued to come down. This year, uh, there's been kind of a, a little bit of bumpiness in the data, but it's still the case inflation now is mid twos. So the assessment is to complete the journey, to complete the return to 2%, going from the mid twos to 2% still needs, I think for, for uh, some time, a restrictive interest rate. But I think uh, keeping it at 4% for too long uh, would, would maybe be uh, carry its own risks. So it, it's a careful step to go from uh, four to three seventy five. If you remember in, in the hiking cycle, there's a, some fairly big movements in each meeting. So this is a step. And as you know, what we did in parallel is to communicate uh, exactly when the next step will be, how quickly we're going to move between this year and next year will be data dependent. So we are in a world of uncertainty. There are many open questions, but we also need to recognize having an inflation rate now in the mid twos is a very different environment to last September uh, when we when we made that final hike. And it's a very different environment, if you like, to that very difficult period, uh, in uh, especially in 2022, 
when inflation was rising so quickly. So uh, I, I, I do think it's a new phase. Uh, but as you say, exactly uh, what that phrase is going to look like, uh, let's see. Um, you mentioned restrictive. So uh, interest rates are in restrictive territory, so we're restricting the economy, which is the point, of course. This is how you um, bring inflation down by restricting demand. Um, but that also means economic pain for companies, for households, generally speaking. It doesn't seem so bad at this point. Uh, what is the state of the economy? So I think um, there is a very big fundamental factor which you, you've just uh, uh, implicitly raised there which is we do have low unemployment absolutely the single biggest economic problem would be if we saw unemployment rising we don't have that I think that, that does mean uh, the urgency around the world of, of bringing rates down quickly uh, we don't have that context but we still have to recognise we, we had a uh, basically 15 months from late uh, 22 un until basically the end of last year when the European economy was flatlining. Uh, we see restrictiveness in, uh, you know, a kind of uh, limited amount of investment in housing, and we know housing is a big issue ar around Europe, limited business investment, and consumption has been very modest. So people not only care about having a job, but they care also about uh, are we investing in our future? What What does my living standard look like in terms of consumption? So I think we are clearly restrictive. Uh, and we do have in, in our forecast that the economy, basically from now on, should be recovering at a good clip. But that's recovering from, if you like, a subdued level. And so monetary policy, we think, is still going to be restrictive because uh, that rebound phase, when you're coming off the bottom, it's still below if like the, where the trend of the economy should take us. Uh, and so I, I think um, the spare capacity in the European economy, uh, so we can grow for a while without creating uh, additional inflation pressure. And, and that is, if you like, the sweet spot of what we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure we still continue to disinflate, but, we, uh, but also to make sure the economy starts to grow again uh, and to deliver all that it needs to deliver uh, for, for the European uh, population. And this is the much talked about soft landing, which is a simplistic term, but... Well, I think it's very important. It, it's in, this is a, it's also obviously a popular term in America. Yeah. I, I do not describe the European situation like that, because remember, we have had uh, f 15 months, five quarters, where the economy did not grow very much. So in the labour market, yes, there has been a soft la landing in the labour market. But I think uh, for many businesses, for many people who would like to see you know, more, uh, more housing being built, more infrastructure being built, uh, to see their companies invest in the future, um, to see the European economy become more productive, uh, this has not been free. Um, and uh, uh, we, we need to make sure that we, we do our job. So yes, we need to take our time to make sure inflation comes back to target, but also keep an eye on these side effects. So um, what happens after a rate cut typically is that people want to know when's the next rate cut. Yeah. Um, you've talked about this uncertainty. Uh, the president was very clear that there's no pre-commitment to our rate path at the moment. How do you go about handling this uncertainty as you decide what to do next? So I, I think this is a, a very important issue. And, you know, I think over th these months where we've emphasized meeting by meeting decision making, I think it's a very good way to handle the uncertainty. So um, I, I think in terms of communicating uh, w with the public, it's a very strong message to send is essentially we're ready. We're ready if there are upside surprises. So if there's upside surprises, clearly we're going to do less. Uh, we're ready if there are downside surprises where we can move more quickly. So the speed um, of, of what we do um, between this year and next year uh, will depend essentially on, on how that uncertainty plays out. Uh, you know, one version is essentially uh, the world uh, proceeds in a fairly calm way. Uh, another version is we there, there are you know new events around the world that that kind of put upward pressure on prices. 
and we also need to keep an open mind uh, that we can also have events which lead to surprisingly fast disinflation. So the no pre-commitment is another way of saying the central bank will be agile. We will be responding uh, to the information that comes in for every meeting. And the information can come in from many different places, uh, including actions of central banks elsewhere or the uh, outcomes of economies elsewhere, correct? Sure, it's, it's a global economy, but l let me focus or let me emphasize there should be no doubt that we have a, the euro area is a continental sized economy. By far, the most important factors are at home. So, how uh, the conditions in Europe heavily influenced in, in terms of the financial system by, by what we decide. That is most important. But big events, big events elsewhere will spill over into global commodity markets, into uh, the financial markets, into exchange rates. So uh, we always uh, are very attentive to global developments. But I would say we're not a small open economy. Uh, we have a lot of uh, autonomy. Um, and this is why, you know, most important will be how the European economy develops. Now, uh, this uncertainty that's out there is is a key feature of this year's ECB forum on central banking. Uh, that takes place at the start of July in Sintra, as noted. We'll focus on monetary policy in an era of transformation. It's our biggest uh, conference of the year, uh, brings together central bankers, policymakers, academics from all over the world. So we're looking for some insightful conversations. We're also publishing the research papers of the Young Economist Prize and finalists. Uh, these will be discussed at the event. And uh, for listeners, take a look at our show notes. You can already uh, have a look there and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, Philip, you'll be at the event, of course, a key part of that. What are you looking forward to most there? So, I mean, it, it, this is, a, I think, a, a very important annual event. We, we put a lot of uh, planning into it. And really, this year, I, I would say there's really uh, two parts to it. One is trying to understand what's been happening in these years. So f among the kind of uh, the, the sessions, there'll be a session on, you know, where did this uh, high inflation come from? What is the contribution of different factors? And also to be a session about how central banks have responded in terms of interest rates. So that's our core business. But on top of that, the, the future of the European economy very much depends on factors such as productivity. So we're going to have a session on productivity and also a session on biodiversity. So you would, I think uh, the listeners will have, be aware that uh, we're focusing a lot on global warming and climate change. But I think the span of this extends to thinking about the interaction between the natural world and the economic world. And, and this work, I think, on biodiversity, various central banks now working on it. We also w will have a kind of a discussion panels on, on geopolitical shocks as we just talked about, this yeah. is a, uh, and also about what we call equilibrium interest rates, which is basically in the long term future as inflation comes back to, down to 2%. And if there's no new shock arriving, where do we think interest rates are headed? But let me also say there is a bit of a gear shift uh, this year in some ways, and which I think uh, goes back to what I just said. The ECB is a big part of the world financial system, and we should also take a global perspective. So there's going to be a, a new session on the international fin financial system, which will feature the, the governor of the South African Reserve Bank and, and also one of our own class not who's head of the Financial Stability Board. And then the, the policymaker panel, of course, will have President Lagarde and, uh, and Jay Powell from the Federal Reserve, but also Roberto Campos, who's the governor of the Bank of Brazil. So in terms of... Uh, the central not only being a European forum, but a global forum for central banking. I, I think those those innovations uh, will really help us expand the scope of what what we what we what we do at, in Sintra. There's some big themes out there, some uh, some important ones. I just want to quickly uh, focus in on one, um, which is productivity, because the productivity puzzle is the uh, sort of the buzzword you get out there, and why Europe seems to be lagging behind the US and, and whether we really have a, a major problem there. Well, what do you think? So uh, I think uh, there's two different conversations mm. and it's important to, to bear that in mind. And we recently in the ECB blog, some of our researchers uh, expanded upon this. So again, over the near term, uh, we think as the economy recovers, 
there's a cyclical pickup in productivity because right now the spare capacity if demand goes up uh, firms in different sectors can produce more without necessarily having to invest more or add more people but even uh, once you look through that because that's a a short-term cyclical recovery as you say there are big questions about the future and uh, Beyond uh, thinking about capital markets union, banking union, the amount of investment we need for the green transition, we also have to think about you know Europe as a place to do business, where people compare and contrast w- w- with America. We have to think about uh, automation, innovation, AI. So this is, a, again, a, I don't think Cintra is going to settle the debate. <laughs> uh, but in terms of helping people to think through these, these fundamental issues, it's very important. Okay. That brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank you, uh, Philip, for joining us for this conversation. Um, However, uh, before you go, as always, uh, we do ask all our guests on the podcast for a hot tip. And I wonder if you have one for today. I I do. I think this is uh, super hot. So uh, we've talked a lot about topical issues, Mm. about the issues uh, that have been right in front of us at the moment. We've talked a bit about the future in terms of uh, productivity, biodiversity. But let me also emphasize that here at ECB, you know, we have people who think a lot about the whole history of, of, of money, mm-hmm. the whole history of central banking. So if you're looking for a beach read, uh, Ulrich Binsile, who's the director general uh, of market infrastructure here at ECB, uh, does have a very interesting and short book. So it, <laughs> it, it, it's uh, called Central Banking um, uh, Before 1800. So it's about what we can learn about basically the evolution of what we now think of central banks between 1400 and 1800. To many people, they may not uh, have thought very much about this. And Ulrich, I think, provides a very nice guide into showing how the world did not uh, uh, start in 1999 with the uh, launch of the ECB. Uh, And I would say uh, going back and looking at that period uh, between 1400 and 1800 uh, uh, might be a a very nice way to spend the summer. That sounds like some great holiday reading. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Philip. So I want to uh, thank ECB Chief Economist Philip Arlane for joining the conversation. That brings us to the end of this episode. For those of you looking to hear more about some of the topics we discussed today, though, you will want to follow our ECB Forum on Central Banking, taking place from the 1st to the 3rd of July from Sintra, Portugal. It will be live streamed, so check out the show notes to get the link to the programme and to the papers. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Paul Gordon. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. And in the spirit of Europe, I'd like to say in Czech, nach Ledenau. I hope that went well. Until next time, thanks for listening.